praise the Lord. I'm just looking for a starting scripture here. <laughs> I want to continue in our uh, discussion of the glory of the Lord and, and being the temple of God. And so, uh, you know, I'll just br bring out the fact that we know in the Old Testament that God dwelt, uh, His presence dwelt in, first of all, in the tabernacle and then in the temple of God. And, uh, but it wasn't His best place. He, he, his presence was there and from time to time, it would come into manifestation and his glory would fill it. And, uh, but we find from the New Testament that God doesn't really dwell in temples made by man or made by hand, but he dwells in us. That was always his intention. In fact, the, the temple and the tabernacle before it were, were types of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have been joined to Christ. And in union with him, uh, not only individually are our bodies the temple of the Holy Ghost. We know that because the Holy Ghost does live inside of each one of us individually. But because of our union with Christ, we are Christ. He's the head. We are the body. We're one. And Christ is the ultimate, ultimate temple of God. And because he dwells in Christ, he dwells, the Holy Spirit dwells in Christ, he dwells in the church collectively. Yeah. And we brought out this fact that uh, in, we said there were, we pointed out that there were five different representations of the temple of God in the Bible. Uh, and I've already mentioned the tabernacle, uh, the Solomon's temple, and of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, we just mentioned, the individual believer we've just talked about, and collectively the church. Well, in, in, if you take the church out of that equation, if you, if you look at the tabernacle, if you look at the temple, if you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you look at the individual believer, though we and it were and he was indwelt, he being Christ, even though he was indwelt by the Spirit, he had to then go and be filled with the Spirit. Remember, he went and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And when he came up out of the river, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Remember that? And then it says in Luke that he returned, having been filled with the Spirit, he returned in the power of the Spirit after the time of, uh, of uh, temptation. And he, he demonstrated the Spirit-filled life on a level that nobody else has ever demonstrated before. Right. Amen? But if Christ had to be, though he was born of the Spirit, had the Spirit, had to be filled with the Spirit, if the tabernacle had the Holy Spirit, had God's presence in it, in it but from time to time it was filled with the Spirit and that, and that glory appeared, same thing with the tabernacle, the same thing with you and me, then it just makes sense that the church collectively, being indwelt by the Spirit, can also the church can also go from that and be filled with the Spirit. Just like you as an individual went from being indwelt by the Spirit to being filled with the Spirit. The body of Christ, and the only way that I can see that happening until we're caught up to be with Jesus in the air, for that to happen to the whole church, it has to happen in individual churches, in congregations. Because we come together in one accord and we're members of one another and we have a common calling and a common vision and a common purpose. And, and, and it says in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 that when they all became one and thinking and praising the Lord. Well, that can only happen really in a local church setting. Now, there are times when we have uh, like large conventions or meetings, you know, where a lot of people come from different churches. You know, things like that will happen then, but the potential is not as great there as it is in a local church. That's the truth. Now, Dad Hagen explained that. In his meetings, uh, camp meetings or winter Bible seminar or other meetings that we would go to, many times the, the glory of God would come in, but he always, he always expressed it this way. He said, the reason that happens on that scale, it happens at, it, because of the office that the minister stands in. That ministerial office is what ushers that in. But he always said, he said, the still, even then you don't reach everybody. He said, you'll never have the whole building in one accord. He said that's only available and only possible in the local church. And so, uh, you know, uh, God wants to fill us with his glory. 
And Dad Hagen always said, he, he was saying it when I was first introduced to him in the 1970s. When I say introduced to him, introduced him through his books and, and, and uh, recordings. Uh, he said then, he said it in the 80s a, a lot more as I, I was around him more. And then all of the rest of his life, he talked about a time when God's glory would fill the church in a way that we've never seen. He talked about a time of revival, a time of special end time move of God. And Brother Hagin tried to get us, tried to get the church. In other words, he was leading and, and endeavoring to bring the church to that place. He was never able to fully get us there. But you know, just because he left, the mandate didn't leave. The will of God didn't change. The purpose of God didn't change. And, and God still wants to carry us to that place. And I thank the Lord with all of my heart that we are moving toward that. Amen. We're making progress. Glory to God. Amen. So we must have greater demonstrations and manifestations of the Spirit before the Lord returns. Well, we talked about this. And I'll just mention it real, real, real quickly. Why aren't, aren't there more manifestations and demonstrations today? Well, there's not sufficient reverence for God in a lot of churches. There's not sufficient unity. There's not enough real desire for it. People come to church for a lot of different reasons. And, and, but I like the thing that 1 Corinthians chapter 2 refers to. It talks about faith in the power of God. Until the church comes to a place that it really has faith in God's power and all of the manifestations of that power, that power won't fully be in manifestation. Amen. God responds to faith. Faith in the power of God. And as I mentioned last week, I think faith for the power of God. Amen. Glory to God. So I want to uh, start today and just kind of build on this. And, and I think I have, I think I have four points. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Turn with me to Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, and let's read verse 1 and 2. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. Well, can we see that all around us? But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Hallelujah. God desires to manifest his glory among his people. It is a desire and he said it would happen. Amen. But I want to I want to deal with another thought. Uh, how many of uh, of you have heard I frankly heard this uh, saying from the scriptures all of my life basically. God will not share his glory with another. Anybody heard that before? Yeah. Only, there's seven people in here heard that. <laughs> I thought it was more wise. How many of you have heard that before? I will not share, the Lord will not share his glory with another. Well, is, is that really true? Let's go, where, let's find out where, that's, where that scripture comes from. What, what verse says that? Go with me to Isaiah 48. 48, and let's look at, we'll start in verse 3, and we're going to go down to verse 11. Verse 11 says, the last sentence says, and, my, and I will not give my glory to another. Okay, but we're going to start in verse 3. Get the con you know context is everything <laughs> when it comes to studying the Bible. Hallelujah. In verse 3 it says, I, I, sh I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them and they came to pass because I knew that you were obstinate, talking to, to the children of Israel, and your neck was an iron sinew and your, bro, and your brow was bronze. Even from the, in, from the beginning, get my tongue straightened up here. Even from the beginning, I have declared it to you. Before it came to pass, I proclaimed it to you, lest you should say, now notice, my idol has done them. 
and my carved image and my molded image have commanded them. You have heard, seen all of this, you see all of this, and will you not declare it? I have made you hear new things from this time, hidden things, and you did not know them. They are not created now, excuse me, they are created now and not from the beginning. And before this day, you have not heard them, lest you should say, of course I knew them. Surely you did not hear, surely you did not know, surely from long ago your ear was not opened, for I knew you would deal very treacherously and were called a transgressor from the womb. For my namesake, I will defer my anger, and for my praise, I will refrain it from you, so that I do not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake, and for my own sake, I will do it. For how shall my name be profaned, and I will not give my glory to another? Now, the other he's talking about, he referred to in verse number five. Lest you should say, my idol has done them, and my carved image and my molded image, you, they have commanded them. When he said, I will not give my glory to another, he was talking about the graven images and the, and the false idols that the children of Israel had and would build and make among themselves. He said, I will retain my glory and I'll not give my glory to these false gods. Now let me, let me just distinguish something also that will help us. When the scripture says here, and we're going to read the other verse where, where it's quoted very often. When he's talking about my glory, he's not talking about uh, uh, the glory in the sense that we're talking about. He's talking about his praise. He said, I will, not, I will not give my glory and my honor to false gods. I will not share my, let's say it this way, I will not share my praise with another. Now when we talk about the manifestation of God's glory, we're talking about that, that, that radiant excellency of his presence when it, when it comes in. We're, that, that's, not, that's not the praise of God, that's the presence of God. So when he says, I'll not give my glory to another, he's talking about giving his praise to another. Okay? As far as his presence, the glory of his presence, that's really not even in view here. Let's go on over to the 42nd chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah 42. And let's look. We're going to start at verse number 6. We're going to go down to verse 8. Verse number 6. And I should get into the 42nd chapter. Verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. And will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. Now if you go back and look at this passage. He's really talking about the Lord Jesus. This message is about the servant of the Lord who was to come. Who was the Messiah. Okay. But it applies to the church as well. And I'll, and I'll show you how in just a minute. I the Lord have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. Now notice, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison. You don't have to turn there, but if you, if you take time, just make this note. Go back later today and look at Acts 13, verse 47. The apostle Paul claimed this verse of scripture. He quoted this verse and, and said, this applies to me. He said, the Lord sent us to be a light to the Gentiles. He took that scripture and applied it to himself because it applies to anyone who goes out from Christ as a, as a representative of him, okay? Ultimately, of course, it has its, its fulfillment in Christ, but we are part of Christ. So he says, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house, I am the Lord, this is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. So uh, we can lay that idea to rest 
that God's glory cannot be upon his people because he reserves that for himself. That's not true. His praise, he reserves unto himself. And, and when the glory is considered, just like we lift our hands and say, glory to God, that he won't share with anybody else. And, and we're not looking to share it with him, are we? Amen. Praise the Lord. No, Jesus said this in John 17 when he was praying. He said, Father, the glory that you have given me, I will give to them. We saw him, we behold him, full of grace and truth. Now, in that sense, it's not talking about praise. It's talking about that, the splendor of his presence, the glory of God. He said, I will give my glory. The glory that you've given me, I will give to them. So God is all about sharing his glory. I said, God is all about sharing his glory with his church. Not the church will not be, the church will not receive glory from men or from one another, but the glory of his presence. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He wants to share that. Jesus embodied the glory of God in human flesh, and he has transferred that glory to the church. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So that was point number one. God desires to manifest his glory among his people. Number two, God's glory will be upon those who worship him in his ways. In the Old Testament, we looked at, uh, let's go to Exodus 40. We've already looked at this, but we'll look at it again. Exodus 40, when Moses uh, and all of the workers completed everything and the tabernacle and everything was done according to God's plan. And uh, it says in, in, uh, in Exodus 40, verse number 30, he set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water there for washing. And Moses and Aaron, his sons, would wash their hands and their feet with water from it. Whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting and they came out near the, the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar, hung up the screen of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because, because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled it, filled the tabernacle. Hallelujah. So God manifested his visible glory in the Old Testament when his order of worship was established and honored among his people. The same thing happened in, 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 uh, at the dedication of the temple of, of Solomon. Is that right? We've read that many times. Well, in the New Testament, it's still true. Biblically ordered worship. Biblically ordered worship. Not mindless worship. But worship, like Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. Biblically ordered worship ushers in the glorious reign and order of the glorious God. I'll say that again. Biblically ordered worship ushers in the glorious order of the eternal God because he is the God of glory. We're going to have his presence. We're going to have his glory. Go with me back to uh, Isaiah 60 again. Something else we need to see in this verse. Isaiah 60, or in this chapter. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Verse 7 says, all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of, how do you say it, Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall ascend with the acceptance, with acceptance on my altar and I will glorify the house of my glory. Notice the house of God is the house of his glory. We, we uh, that's why, that's why I'm so careful not to draw attention to the natural house. I don't like those expressions. Oh, you know, the house, the house. 
I, because, it, because the world talks about the house. You know, so-and-so is in the house. You know, who in the house. I, it, it, we cannot divorce popular, popular culture a lot of times unconsciously from creeping in. That's why I don't like to talk about the house in any other way than the house of his glory. The house of his glory. That's who we are. That's what we are. That's who we are. Any other verb tense you want to use? We were, would be, are, shall, be, is. We are the house of his glory. That is so powerful. Would he not respond to biblical worship with his glory like he did days of old? And, and in the New Testament. Yeah. When the, when the angels appeared to, to the shepherds out on the hillside, they were, appeared angels. And there was all of this praise going on. And the, and the, and the, uh, the shepherds were caught up in that. And the glory of the Lord says shone all around. Them. The glory of the Lord can be very, very bright. That's what the Apostle Paul, remember, saw on the road to Damascus. He said he was on that road, and he said suddenly, a bright light from heaven. Now, in another place, it said it was around noontime. It's the time when the, when the sun is brighter than any other time of day. He said, and suddenly, a, a bright, brilliant light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone all around me. And what did he do? He fell. Because people often fall in that glory. That light was the glory of God. And when he got up, he couldn't see. And he testified that he could not see because of the glory of that light. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus said, you shall worship in spirit and in truth. And when we worship in spirit and in truth, then God inhabits our praise. That's what he does. He inhabits the praises of his people. And that inhabiting of his praise, that is the expression of his glory. When God, see God is here all the time. He, he's among us all the time. We could, we could be, I, I, I remember this years ago, when we first came to, to uh, High Springs. One of the churches in town had this, had this uh, deacon's meeting and the whole church, of, I don't know, it was a big church mess. And uh, they had this meeting and it got so contentious and people were so mad. I mean, they were yelling at one another and it was just, it was a church meeting. And, and one of the men in the church had a heart attack and the, and the paramedics had to come and take him away because he got so worked up in anger. Well, did you know, even then... God dwelt among them. He was in them collectively as a church because he, he, he is. But his glory wasn't present that day. It wasn't in manifestation. Amen. But when we come together in spirit and in truth, when we're worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, oh my, 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 glory to God. Jesus told Brother Hagin whenever he talked to him about worship, Back in 1987, Jesus appeared to him and talked to him for over two hours. And uh, one of the things he talked about was proper praise and worship in the new covenant. And he made this statement. He, said he, had, he had talked about the Old Testament. And then he said, when you come into the New Testament, this is what Jesus said to Brother Hagin, you find that all praise and worship is to be done in the Spirit. That's why I don't like Places where something is worked up. Or, you know, people know how to do certain things. You know, to, to cause an effect. And so often that caused effect is, is represented as a move of God and it isn't. We, we have to, all praise and worship in the New Testament church is to be done in the spirit. Now, that doesn't mean in the spooky natural. That's what, no, that's what Randall Greer calls the supernatural that's, that's not really God. He calls it the spooky natural. It doesn't mean we walk in, ooh, you know, we'd, 
kind of have a faraway look in our eyes and, you know, can't talk straight to one another, you know. That's not what he's talking about. Being in the Spirit uh, is largely just being biblical. Just being biblical. Just obeying the Bible. You know, just when somebody just really made you mad and insulted you and, and you just... Oh, Father, I just, I refuse to take offense. I, re- I just forgive that person. You're in the Spirit. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the way we're supposed to live. Amen? But when it comes to our corporate worship, we, we must ever be mindful of the presence of God. Amen? Because His glory will always be upon those who worship Him correctly. Amen? Whenever a church honors the Word of God exalts the Son of God and gives place to the Spirit of God, His presence and blessing will pour forth. The glory of the Lord will be the increasing portion of any congregation that pursues a pathway of humility. Now, I didn't write this. I quote, I'm quoting someone. The glory of the Lord will be the increasing portion of any congregation that pursues a pathway of humility before God's throne, His Word, His Son and His Spirit, He will come to dwell therein. Amen. Because whenever a church honors the Word of God, exalts the Son of God, gives place to the Spirit of God, God's presence and His blessing will be there. We can count on that, church. We can count on that. It's not a matter of working something up. The only thing we have to work up is stir up our hearts. And we're, we're instructed in scriptures to do that. That's the only stirring up that needs to go on. We shouldn't have to have the praise and worship leader jump through hoops. It's a good thing because he can't jump right now. <laughs> That's, it shouldn't be the, 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 the job of the worship leader to get everybody cranked up, you know. No, we ought to come in ready. Ready. I mean, at the very first chord, the very first song, at the very first statement of glory and praise to God, just be in it with all of our heart. Oh, hallelujah. God will always be there. And visible or not, His Spirit will always be distinctly present. Oh, hallelujah. Ooh, glory. Next point is people saved and unsaved will recognize that presence and gather there. Because mankind instinctively longs for restoration of the presence of God. The absence of God's glory characterizes fallen man. When Adam and Eve sinned, the the awareness of their separation from that glory was overwhelming. They hid themselves when God came to talk to them because they had lost the sense of of his glory, of his presence. He came to them as an intruder into their life. And they were ashamed and they were fearful and drew back from him. That happened when man, and it happened to all of mankind because Romans says, for all have sinned and fall short of what? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, there's an, there's an indication there, there's a suggestion there in that verse that man was created to live in God's glory. And we can see that in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were so conscious of God's presence, they didn't even know they didn't have clothes on. It had not even occurred to them yet. They were so aware of God's presence Man was originally created for God's glory and God's honor to be upon him. Not not just to give glory and honor to God in the sense of praise, but for his glory and honor to be resident upon them. Amen. Go with me to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. This is a psalm of David and he was reflecting on something that that got his attention. He didn't understand it. Verse number three says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man, that's just another expression for man, 
that you would visit him. Now, this, is, this very thought, this very uh, uh, paradox here is what is a stumbling block to unsaved people far and wide. I know of people who simply cannot believe in God because they look at the greatness of the universe and how vast it is and how overwhelming it is. How, how, can, how can God be interested in little specks? Not even specks. Not, I mean, not even a speck of a speck. <laughs> how, how, how can you say, Christian... That God talks to you and that God is in your life. I mean, who is God? We don't even know who he is and we're nothing here. It gives, right, it, gives, it gives rise to all of the false doctrines and false religions, including, including environmentalism, which is a false religion, that, that dis, disowns God and that mankind is nothing. We should all go away and let the crickets and the, and the raccoons take over. That's really what the extreme environmentalists would like to see. All humanity just die back and give it to the snakes and buzzards. We don't really have a place here. We're all, they say we're all intruders. Extreme environmentalists say people are intruders on this planet. If we're here, we ought to just be in little, you know, hut somewhere, burning something that, that isn't a fossil fuel that you would, of course, have, in, have to have industry to make. But anyway, that's an absurdity beside the point. <laughs> what is man? But see, David was asking the question from a godly perspective, and he, was, and he answered it in revelation knowledge. What is man that you're mindful of him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him, who? Man, with glory and honor. You have made man to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under man's feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beast of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. Hallelujah. Everything on this planet, God put under the dominion of mankind and crowned man with glory and honor. But you see, all sinned and fell short. We, we weren't created short. We fell short of the glory of God. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad that the second chapter of Hebrews is in the Bible. Ooh, hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 2. Glory to God. What would we do without Hebrews 2? Hallelujah. Verse number 5 says, For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. Now that world to come uh, is, we, we, we don't have what he's describing here is not going on in its fullness because it, it won't really be in full manifestation until Jesus comes back and sets up his reign on the earth. Okay, that's the full manifestation. He says, for the world, he has put the world to come of which we speak in subject. He has not put the world of which we speak in, in, in subjection to angels. But one has testified in a certain place saying, and that's of course Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now, who is him? Us, man. It's talking about man. But notice in verse 8, it goes on to say, For in that God put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. You can, you can readily see that that's not true yet. I mean, in experience. I mean, this world is suddenly, I mean, is certainly uh, not being uh, 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 cared for and stewarded by man under the dominion that it's supposed to be. That doesn't exist yet. Amen. I don't know about you. If I'm in the woods and I hear a bear coming... I'm going to try to get out of there because that bear doesn't know my dominion yet. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm not saying in, in, in an encounter I couldn't stand my ground, but I'm not looking for that encounter. <laughs> I was fishing one time in, in, in Wyoming, and I, and I waded down or, or walked down uh, through, the, through the brush in the woods there, and I come up on a moose, a big old moose. I just very carefully backed away because that was not an encounter I wanted to have. They are not friendly. Amen. Praise the Lord. Keep on reading. But we see, we do not yet see man. We do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, the man, Christ Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for everyone. That glory and honor that Jesus was crowned with was the glory and honor that God crowned Adam with. Amen. That was the glory and the honor. He laid aside his heavenly glory when he came here. But we beheld, we beheld his glory even the glory of the Son of God. That was, that was the glory that God had always ordained to be upon mankind. He walked in that. And oh, he was glorious. Hallelujah. For both he who sanctifies and those who... Oh, I skipped a verse. Verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. It was fitting for him, the one who created everything. In, in bringing many sons to glory, make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. In bringing many sons to glory. Now, we do, it's, he's talking about the world that is to come, the time that is to come, because we're not fully walking in that yet. But his glory is still upon the church. Amen. His glory, it's still his intention that his glory fill the church. Oh, hallelujah. Whew. Praise the Lord. The searching of the human heart is ultimately only fulfilled in the presence of that glory. That's what people are looking for. They don't know it. We say a lot of times they're looking for God. They're looking for God's presence in their lives. They, many times they don't even believe in God. But they're looking, all, and, and we say it all the time, looking for God in all the wrong places. And we know all the different ways that, that, that humanity searches for God. But what they're really trying to connect with is that inherent uh, purpose that is on the inside of everyone. And that is to know God's presence, to be in his presence, to experience his presence. Hallelujah. That's why it's so important for us that we strive, uh, not maybe the best word, but we, we, we work and endeavor as hard as we can more than anything else to provide a place for God, an opportunity for God to show up and to manifest His presence, to manifest His glory. Nothing will touch the human heart it's like the word whenever it's, it's, whenever it's preached with the glory of God and the presence of God. Oh, hallelujah. Now, we do what we can when we minister to people and God honors that and people are saved. But when people come to church, they're, I'm telling you, it ought to be different. And thank God it is, praise the Lord. And people can sense it. Hallelujah. Mm. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this last point. So I've run out of time here because it, it, it's kind of a lengthy point. Hallelujah. It wasn't lengthy yesterday, but <laughs> last night late it got lengthier. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Let's just stand up and thank him for his, for his graciousness. And, you know, there's something about the grace of God the glory, of, the glory of God and the grace of God are two different matters. The, gra the grace of God is extended to sinners. And, you know, you, you can have sinners outside the church, but you can have people sinning in the church. I've been pastoring too long. <laughs> 
to not know that people, people in the church will sin just like people in, in the world do sometimes. And so God's grace is extended to sinful people. But His glory, His glory is reserved for those who will walk in His way. It's not a matter of grace. He is gracious to us. But His glory is something that belongs to the people of God when they align with His purpose, come into harmony with His plan and His ways. Oh, glory to God. And give Him the praise, glory, and honor that is due Him. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Father. In that sense, Father, we are humbled to know, Father, that you would dwell among us and manifest, oh my, your presence, your presence among us, Father, filling us with your spirit, filling us with your glory. Father, may that always be our purpose. May it always be our, our, our goal, the thing we seek after. And the thing, Father, that we give ourselves to. May it always be, Father, our highest aim. To, to please you to yield to you, to honor you as we should. And you have to help us, Father, along that way because we're, we're still not perfect in all our ways, Lord. We still need help. But it, we pray, Father, that it always remains our purpose to give the glory and honor that you alone deserve so that the glory and honor that you will to share and pour over us and manifest among us is in full manifestation according to your will, Father. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of churches that, that are looking for all kinds of superficialities. As, as, a, as a, a means of getting people to church. But none of those things will create a right heart in people. None of those things will cultivate a hunger for God like walking into a place that is full of His glory. Oh, hallelujah. Doesn't mean that we can't have uh, different ways and, and new ways of doing things. That's not what I mean. But, but if we think methods other than God's method is going to draw people to Christ, we are, we are sorely mistaken. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Your word and your spirit always agree. Your word and your spirit always agree. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We honor you today. We bless you, Father. Oh, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. God is so good. Oh, my goodness. You can sense his presence in our service from today, from the very first song. Hallelujah. And it hasn't lifted. It's here. We have nothing to take credit for because it's all the work of God. Yes, we, we do our part to yield and to obey. But Jesus said at the end of the day, we're all to say, I just did what I was instructed to do. I'm just an unprofitable servant. I just did what I was told. All of the glory and honor goes to God. Amen. Anything that we do right, and I've, I've praised us this morning, you know, about uh, you know, your, your, your heart and coming in here today wholeheartedly. But even that God helped us do. Without him, that wouldn't have happened. Amen. We just always have to stay humble before God's presence. Hallelujah. Because my next point, and I, I'll just give you the, the point and I won't elaborate on the, the, the glory of the Lord can be lost. It, it, can, it can go away. Go away, sometimes a whole lot easier than it came. 
<laughs> and so uh, we need to know that too. Amen. But praise the Lord, we don't have to let that happen. If we'll stay humble before God, stay hungry and obedient to the Lord, we can have everything He has for us. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. We humbly, humbly submit ourselves to you. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad I came today. Glad I came. Praise God. Mm. Man. Whew. Nothing, nothing, nothing in this world like being in the presence of God with His church. With my brothers and sisters in Christ. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're all different, but we all have this in common. We are Christ. Amen. He is in us and we're in Him. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. That makes every other earthly distinction just fade into the corner. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.